<laughs> since I didn't have my gavel here. So are we ready, um, clerk and uh, METV? Are we good to go? Be good to go? Good. Okay. Well, thank you and welcome everyone to the March 3rd, 2020 Council of Governments meeting. I will let you know that the Manatee County Commissioners have been in the meeting here since 9 o'clock this morning, so we're going to keep this baby rolling and uh, move on quickly, hopefully. Um, I did want to state that um, um, our may neither one of our mayors are going to be here right to start with. Uh, Mayor Poston had, I guess, um, something going on, and Mayor Shirley is a little bit under the weather. So um, we'll be winging it and uh, appreciate everyone coming here today. Um, before we uh, get going with our agenda, I have um, Jake Seller. Is he here? Where is he? Right behind me. I'm going to have to go way up there to the podium. Um, yesterday, uh, Commissioner Baugh and myself, as well as many staff members, um, our public safety director and Steve Lichauer, our P PIO, also attended the, and uh, also our um, school superintendent, attended the uh, press conference with the governor yesterday so that we could be brought up to speed with the um, coronavirus I guess it's COVID-19 or however you say that, um, and when, how we're being affected in Manatee County. So we're going to give a little bit more real-time information. I know things are changing so rapidly, and we've been in a meeting since 9 o'clock, so we're probably not even up to speed with what's going on. But we're going to have a briefing and have an opportunity for you folks to ask questions if you'd like. So, Jake. Good afternoon. Uh, Jake Sauer, Director of Public Safety for Manatee County. I, uh, I feel like I haven't left here from this morning, but I did leave. I'm, I feel sorry for the rest of you guys, but um, Administrator Corey has asked me to brief you guys briefly on COVID-19. Um, so in December of 2019, a new strain of coronavirus emerged in the city of Wuhan, China. In the months to follow, the virus rapidly spread with 88,948 cases now being reported in over 70 countries around the globe, according to the World Health Organization. On March 1st, the Florida Department of Health announced that a patient from Manatee County had a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19, the disease caused by this particular strain of coronavirus. <clears throat> the patient is an, ad an adult resident that does not have any travel history to countries that have restricted travel protocols being implemented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The patient sought out health care and was isolated. Moreover, the patient will remain in isolation until cleared by public health officials. Two additional people who came in contact with that patient have since been quarantined out of an abundance of caution. Last week, I asked Chief Steve Litchauer and the Public Safety Emergency Management Team to become the Manatee County Government's Incident Management Team, ready to assist the Florida Department of Health and Florida Department of Health Manatee with any needs they may have. Emergency management tasks are maintain safety of our county employees and partner agencies by providing policy procedures and guidance that reflects best practices. Identify unmet needs regarding personnel protective equipment for EMS, law enforcement, and fire services. Develop actionable, informative, and accurate public information in tandem with the Florida Department of Health and other partner enti entities. <coughs> Share information with local and state partners to establish and maintain a common operating picture. And finally, maintain close coordination with the Florida Department of Health to ensure that any resource or personnel request are requests are fulfilled in a timely manner. Yesterday, Manatee County Department of Health, along with the De Department of Public Safety and community stakeholders, met to discuss best practices and any unmet needs and communication throughout this incident. It is important to note that the key to managing information and communication with the public is to speak with the same message from all community leaders. Yesterday, Manatee County published the latest press release and then sent that out to our PIO partners through Nick Azera, uh, for use in their messaging as well, if they so need to. Manatee County Government has established a website located at www.mymanatee.org backslash COVID-19. That website, website has pertinent information as well, links to both the Florida Department of Health and the CDC for up-to-date real-time information. Citizens and media are being directed to this website in our community as it is important to remember as this virus spreads over the weeks and months to come, information will change rapidly. As of 4 p.m. today, the Florida Department of Health has 16 pending testing results, 24 tests that were confirmed negative, 
and there are, two, there are 247 persons under public health monitoring, including the two confirmed cases in both Manatee and Hillsborough County. As of about 1 p.m. today, they've added a um, preliminary, preliminary positive case in relation to the Hillsborough patient that tested positive on Sunday, and that patient lives in California. Under the governor's declaration of emergency, it spells out what the public should do if they feel they have come in contact, travel to the five hot areas, which are Italy, Iran, South Korea, China, or Japan, and exhibiting symptoms of fever greater than 100.4, cough unassociated with a pre-existing medical condition, shortness of breath unassociated with a pre-existing medical condition. If that individual should contact the Florida, if that individual displays those signs and symptoms, that individual should contact the local Florida Department of Health at 941-242-6649, and that is both on our website as well as Florida Department of Health made at T. Between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., Monday through Friday, prior to seeking medical care. After hours, if they have decided that they need to seek medical care for these signs and symptoms and they believe that they are within the areas of the hot spots of COVID-19, they should call the receiving facility they plan on going to first. Would you repeat the number, please? Sure, it's 941-242-6649. In conclusion, both Mancy County EMS and all first responders within the community have reported to emergency management their unmet needs for the foreseeable future and no additional equipment is needed at this time. Emergency management and the Public Safety Department will continue to work closely with the Florida Department of Health, Manatee, and Dr. Bensi to keep you informed and prepared to best manage both messages and needs. And with that, I will take any questions if you have them. Are there questions? All right. Um, well, we had a, a good meeting also with um, in the EOC yesterday. I don't know how many people do we have, Jake, there about at the EOC yesterday? Approximately 100. 100 people. That, so we are treating this as it is a public health emergency. And so I appreciate all the first responders that were there, the folks from the school board, all of the, we had a good discussion in the policy group. So everybody is aware and participating and making sure that we do have the best information, but it's a rapidly changing situation. So we'll probably be, be back with more um, information as needed. But I think those hotlines are really good. If you can look them up, you can get also the, um, FloridaHealth.gov, is that what it is? FloridaHealth.gov backslash COVID hyphen 19. 19, and they have a lot of real information. Dr. Saunders. Uh, I also met with the health department uh, today with the joint, our uh, Dr. Bensey, as well as the Sarasota, the lead of the Sarasota Health Department, uh, just for further communication within our schools. And one of the protocols that was established today is I will get a call every morning at 8 o'clock uh, letting us know if we have any infected persons within our school system. As of today, we do not. But that is a protocol that we uh, established today that we will put in place just so that we can make sure that uh, our students in our school community feel safe and comfortable coming here each and every day. Okay, great. Carol? Sorry, um, my husband's still on the Medical Society and they just put out something um, to all uh, providers in the county, how to treat an upper respiratory with the specimens and a lower respiratory and they put that out and told them how to collect it and where to send it. So they just did that this afternoon. What, one thing, one last thing is um, <clears throat> both Florida Department of Health Manatee and as well as Public Safety Emergency Management were fielding a lot of calls of whether or not they should cancel their gatherings, planned gatherings. Although this is a very fluid situation and things can change from one day to the next. Right now, uh, I just got off the phone with Dr. Bensey. We are not recommending that you cancel any of your plans, conferences, or gatherings at, the, at this time. Governor said so yesterday as well. Councilman there, Williams? Is there any length of time that a person travels, say, to Italy or Spain that uh, it would take for this to show up? Two to 14 days. Two weeks. Okay. 
So if you've been to those, those places in the past and it's been past 14 days, congratulations, you are out of the clear. <laughs> yes. Anything else? Okay. Thank, well, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Jay. All right. We're going to move on to our agenda items. First up, we have real-time bus information. Bill Steele with the Transit Division Manager, Manatee County Public Works Department, and Ryan Suarez, Transit Planning Manager, Manatee County Public Works Department. So you guys are up. Oh, I'm mine. here. I'm here. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Ryan Suarez, Planning Manager, Manatee County Area Transit. Thank you very much for having me this afternoon. I think we were scheduled for the October meeting, and we got rescheduled today. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about some new technology that we now have on our buses. And um, can everyone hear me well? Mm -hmm. Let me just test something here. <coughs> okay, so now I know how to work this. Very good. Um, we have new technology out on the buses. Um, one of the top questions, as transit agency, we get a lot of questions from customers, as you uh, could imagine. One of the most common questions we get from passengers out on the street is, uh, it's very simply, where's, where's my bus? You know, um, where is it? How long is it going to take for it to get here where I'm at, at this bus stop, at this transit station? Real-time bus information, this is the technology that empowers those people out on the street to know where the bus is at. It's just like real-time traffic information. Um, how long does it take to get from point A to point B? It's got real-time traffic. Google Maps has real-time traffic information. It'll tell you how long it takes to get there. Same concept, same idea, but for bus service here. And what I'm going to talk to you all about is what customers get, the customer-facing features and functionality and how they can find out where that bus is at, how long they have to wait. Okay, so there's five ways. Sorry. The first one is the mobile app. We all use phones, and this is probably going to be the most common way that folks uh, access the system uh, to see the buses um, actually on a map, see them move, and figure out how long it's going to take for that bus to get to their bus stop. You'll see the interface here. You can go to your Google Play Store, to your Apple Store right now, and download this app. It's called My Stop. And it's available from Avail Technologies. That's the vendor that's making this work uh, for us. And if you jump to a screen and allow the app to read your or see your geographic location, you're automatically going to get Manatee County and Manatee County area transit information. And the nice thing about the app, it's very user friendly. You can drill down uh, by route, as you see there on your. Um, left-hand side. Once you select route, um, in this case on your right-hand side you see our Route 3 which uh, operates on Manatee Avenue. All four buses that operate on that route daily show. You can click on those buses and it tells you whether or not those buses are on time or if those buses are late. Now what if you're at a bus stop? You can zoom in <laughs> to a particular bus stop and actually click on it, select it, and you'll get a listing of all the buses that are on your way, on their way, uh, to pick you up, and how long it's going to take uh, for those buses to get to that destination, that bus stop. Now, this is pretty powerful because, uh, again, as a bus rider, you're sitting outside, you're in the elements. Um, sometimes you just don't know. There could be traffic conditions that uh, you're not aware of. We all got to sit in traffic. Uh, someone's waiting for us, and they're asking, where are you at? Um, I'm stuck in traffic. Um, in the past, these passengers didn't have the luxury to be able to call that bus. Now they have that available at their fingertips through the app. There's other functionality available through the app. You can set notifications for yourself. In other words, if I'm uh, in my office, it takes me five minutes to walk to my bus stop. It might be raining, it might be too cold, it might be too hot. I can set a notification by route, by time of day, by bus stop, so that I get a text or an email that tells me my bus may be 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes away, however long I want to set it, so that way I don't have to wait at the bus stop for that particular bus. And there's a variety of other functions in here. That's just one feature that I think adds uh, uh, makes this very approachable and very uh, easy to use for, for bus passengers. 
Second, at bus stops, let's say you haven't downloaded the app and I have a, a sample here, I'll pass it around. A sample of what you see here in the, in the PowerPoint slide. What you'll see on this here is, the difference here is the QR code, the quick read code that's on the bus stop. And that's this little feature right here. What we've done is develop, we have 940 stops out on the road. What we've done is created a unique QR code for every single bus stop. Um, and you can imagine the logistics of this, making sure that we got the right QR code on the right panel at every single bus stop. It took a little bit of effort, but it's worth it because if you scan your phone on that QR code, a similar menu to what you see here in the phone app crops up on your phone so that you can see all the upcoming buses uh, by route uh, that are going to that bus stop that you're waiting at. Now, some phones don't have an automatic QR code reader. You do have to download an app. I think there's some iPhones that you just scan it and automatically reads it. But in, on a lot of the Android, you do have to download a, a QR code reader. There's the website as well. I'm not going to dig into this one because the same functionality that you get via the mobile app, you get on the website. But that is the URL right there if anyone needed uh, to have it. At stations, you're standing at a station and you're not necessarily concerned with, uh, with a unique stop. Um, you have a variety of buses that uh, go to uh, the different stations. And we have these monitors. Imagine something like what you would see at an airport where you have these big monitors tell you arrival and departure times for all these flights that are coming into SRQ, TPA, uh, et cetera. This functions exactly the same way, telling you at what time all those buses that are going to that particular station, what time they're going to be arriving, if they're on time, if they're late. Now, I was at downtown station just this past week. And it was nice to hear from various different passengers how useful this is. They don't look at the app. They don't go to the website, obviously, because it's not easy to access while you're standing at the stop, at the station. But they look at these monitors uh, to find out if their buses are late or if they're on time. Uh, the nice thing about this as well, it's part of a larger infotainment system. provide information on fares. We have lots of videos that educate riders on the rules of the road. Um, if you are in a wheelchair, how we have accessibility features at stations and on buses as well um, that we can display uh, on that part of the screen as well. Public service announcements could include things like you know what to do about coronavirus. We have detours. We have all sorts of notifications that go out regularly about special events. We can make use of this to provide those service announcements as well. You'll see a little box here at the bottom. And I've got a blow up of that on the next slide. It looks uh, something like this. If you push on, and this is probably hard to see for everyone, but that's a button press that button, the information on the larger screen blows up into a larger font, so those who may have some <coughs> visual impairment can now see uh, the arrival information. At the same time, there's actually, actually an audible speech function that's reading the information on that sign as well for those who have trouble hearing also. The, the green ES button translates certain information that's on the monitor into Spanish language. Not everything gets translated or needs to be translated into Spanish language, but some of the information uh, does. And that's important for us because we have a lot of, both of these features are important for us because as, as, as recipients of federal funding, there's a lot of compliance items that we need to adhere to. Uh, these are really civil rights requirements um, that we need to meet and this helps us achieve that. And I went through four already. I haven't been counting them, but this would be the fifth. This is the onboard bus information. We also had monitors installed on the buses. 
And you'll see these are nice uh, 10 by 37 inch monitors that also provide that infotainment feature such as what I described uh, to the, about the monitors at the stations. But importantly here, we have a, let's call it a stop tree, which provides next stop information on board whatever bus route or whatever bus trip you might be on. So we also have, so it's the next stop plus the next three stops that the bus will be <coughs> approaching. And all this interfaces very nicely with other technology that's on the bus, the fare box, the head signs, we call, these are the signs that are on the bus and around to tell you if it's three west, route three west, route three east, and what the end of the line destinations might be. Um, and all this integrates very well with, again, the technology we have there. Um, so I've described what the customer facing features are, but importantly, we also get a lot of benefit um, to ourselves internally. Uh, the oper and I'm, I won't get into the details of the technical aspects of it, but the operators get a single point sign on. That's very important. In the past, they have to sign into all these different pieces of technology. Now they only do it once in one, at one in one device. Let's put it that way. Uh, the dispatch function is also much improved because they can see where all the buses are, which ones are running late. Most importantly for us, which ones are running early. Uh, that's a big no-no. Um, and I got the picture of the technology and the boxes and wires all over there. Uh, just to convey the message that um, there's a lot of work that went into this. It took a team effort. Uh, yeah, I'm here describing it, and we're describing uh, what the customers get, but it was a, an IT operations, planning, procurement, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody else that got involved in the implementation of, of the technology. And I think we are reaping the benefits where we're seeing ridership grow on the system. And I want to say it's because of this technology and because of uh, some other improvements that we've rolled out technology and service wise. And that's all I got. Um, I'm free to answer any questions anyone might have. Any questions? All right, I'll just say that, you know, this is impressive. Um, I know because I served on the t Barta board, and I know Reggie does now, and I know that other agencies around us are trying to pursue this, but we did it. So I want to applaud you guys for what you've done. You've really made great progress with these efforts, and uh, thank you for being leaders for us. Um, I think it will help our uh, population that uses transit. Bill, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, William Steele, transit manager. Just a few concluding remarks. Um, you know, all of these things take a plan. Uh, we started with our transit development plan update in 2012. That was adopted in 2013. Uh, then we worked for a year on a technology business plan. Uh, we worked that with county administration, the technology advisory group, and our IT department. So what you're seeing is a conclusion of seven years of work uh, if you remember, in the past couple years, we also had an interactive voice response system in 2017. And then in 2018, we went to mobile ticketing, where people are actually boarding now with their mobile device. So think about that as a shared platform. You can have trip planning. You know, you can plan your trip. You can buy your ticket. And you can use the same mobile device for your real-time bus information. So we are leading the region, um, and we're proud of that. We've got a rodeo scheduled for March 8th where we're going to have a technology expo. Uh, so Mr. Bellamy will have all our partners from the Tabarda region there, possibly excluding Pasco County. I don't think they could make it. Um, but we're even gonna have Avail Technologies, who's our vendor, uh, represented, represented there as well. So that's a very big event and we're looking forward to it. Um, so yes, there's a, been a plan in place. I wanted to say in conclusion that Ryan's done Yeoman's work over several years. He's been with us six years now. Uh, as the board may know, he's been a part of all our major initiatives. Um, he didn't have any gray hair when he started. <laughs> we were just talking a little bit earlier that he's got some now. He's worked very hard and he's earned all of that. Unfortunately, and I think of him as family, he is leaving Manatee County government in the next couple weeks. Oh. Uh, the call of the private sector. The door is always going to be open for his return, but I did want to make that announcement today, particularly for our Board of County Commissioners. 
and he did excellent work on this project. Um, you knew you could depend. You know you can depend on him at all times. Um, so this is going to be a huge loss. We're already working on his replacement, but I want to say that there's only one Ryan Suarez. So we're going to find the best fit that we possibly can. But truthfully, I don't think anybody could do what Ryan's done for us. And I'm very proud of him. So thank you. Wow. Well, that's sad to hear. Um, Gene? Yes, thank you. Gene Brown, City of Bradenton Councilman. Um, Throughout my ward, which is Ward 2 in the city of Bradenton, kind of 43rd Street, Manatee Avenue, 26th Street, Manatee Avenue to Cortez Road, there's been a lot of lately in the last year or two, and I've got some questions from the city residents that ask where we've put a lot of concrete bus stops with no benches and different things. And uh, is that something that's in the process? And if, if so or not, is there a place that people can go and look on an online situation to find out status of things or are they just concrete slabs with no sidewalks to them or anything which really aren't you know um, beneficial to people if they are handicapped or wheelchaired because they'd have to go on the road to get to the bus stop good question and we're using federal transit administration funds to make all of those stop improvements and we make improvements within that zone of the bus stop so this isn't per se sidewalk construction, but what you will see, and the basic template is a five by eight boarding pad. In other words, five foot wide, eight foot deep. And that really assists with wheelchair deployment from our bus and our bus ramp. We'll tie into whatever's there. Um, if you look closely, you'll see that there's a sidewalk on the other side of a swale. We've actually bridged that swale. Where there isn't a sidewalk, we do the best we can to tie into whatever is available. Um, sometimes that will be a paved shoulder, unfortunately. Other times that might be a driveway that's adjacent to the stop. And we attempt and have put seating at every stop. If we've got ridership, we're going to put a shelter there. If we have less ridership, we'll put a bench there. But we're willing to partner. Uh, if the city's going to be constructing sidewalks in that vicinity, we'll tie into that. If we've already made a stop improvement and your sidewalk improvement comes later, uh, maybe we can tie in as part of your project. But we're willing to partner every single time to make that stop as accessible as it possibly can be. Right, and that, to coming up with partnering, I think it's a good thing that most of us would partner, but unfortunately those roads are your roads too. So they're county roads through the city and our residents don't understand and we've got to explain, it's, it's yes. hard to say, well, that's not right in the middle of our city. It's a county road or an FDOT road. Right. So we're trying to figure out how to marry that well and sitting through some of the meetings today. And I've asked um, your administrator maybe to check on some things because some of our road systems through the city are our in county. need of work, yeah. but it's a county road. So that's, that's what getting our residents to understand. We are working together and we're not as a... Uh, uh, Chairman Benack would say we didn't build a two-lane bridge to nowhere. There was some planning on it earlier, but um, we just need to maybe get some of that information out a little better, why we're doing it, and we just have a concrete pad that's not really safe. It's a concrete pad. It provides a safe boarding location, but getting to that stop without sidewalks is going to be difficult. It was difficult before. Now we've got accessibility, but getting to the stop is still the problem. I've seen improvements over the last several years. Um, you know, we just moved to the Talavast area in 301, 2016. Now we've got a sidewalk on one side of that road. Um, we were at the Public Works Complex on 26th and 30th Avenue. You know, improvement on, on 30th now. That's more accessible with sidewalk. So improvements are being made. Of course, those take time. And being an implementing agency as well, you understand that. So we're going to keep working that. The good thing for us, we're in the Public Works Department. We work very closely with Public Works Administration. So we're a part of those projects when they happen. Um, so we've seen improvements. You'll continue to see improvements. I would ask people to be patient. We're going to continue working it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Questions? OK. Thank you, Bill and Ryan. I'm bummed. I yeah, really, Ryan. really oh, enjoyed working with you. And you've done this once before, so maybe you'll come back again. But we know you're doing what's best for your family. It was a tough decision, and Bill and Chad caught me off guard. They said they were going to mention it here, and I, I, 
I'm gonna miss this place. I am. It's it's a, it was a tough tough decision. It was a, it, it took a while to make, and I I had a great time. I've had a great time, and and I'm still, I guess you can say I'm still committed uh, to Manatee County. I still feel with all the projects and everything that we've accomplished, I, I still feel like this is this is always gonna be a part of me. All right, you've done a great job. Thank you. All right, next step, we're going to have a report on the structure, finances, capital improvements, security challenges, economic impacts, and significant air service growth at Sarasota Braden International Airport by Rick Piccolo, our uh, SRQ president and CEO. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in the interest of time, I promise you I'll shorten it to just one hour. <laughs> uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, obviously, we've had a lot of success. I'd like to uh, tell you all facets of the airport. I hope it, after this presentation you have a full understanding of it, and I'm happy to answer any questions when it's when it's done. The first thing that I'd like to cover is the structure of the airport. What is the Sarasota Manatee Airport Authority? It's actually an independent special district. It was created by the uh, state legislature. It's kind of a quasi-governmental corporation. I like to think it's the closest thing to private industry that you'll find in government. We have a six-member board of directors, three from Sarasota County, three from Manatee County. Uh, the governor appoints those members. Uh, and once the governor appoints, they're appointed. There is no Senate confirmation. Uh, the governor has the final decision on that. They can serve a maximum of two four-year consecutive terms. They're usually business people in the community, and they understand the entrepreneurial nature of the airport, and that's a very important term and theme as I go through my remarks. <clears throat> now, we're kind of like a mini city. We have our own police department, our own fire department, our own public works. All the administrative functions are handled out there. Uh, our police and fire departments have to meet all the same standards uh, that are set for all the other municipal departments. And in fact, our fire department has to meet more than that because they also have to meet certain training requirements that the FAA puts upon them as well. Uh, everything that's done out at the airport is handled by our own employees outside of janitorial, uh, the HVAC, plumbing, all the trades, uh, electrical, Everything out there, landscaping, every grass that's a blade that's cut, uh, all the landscaping that's done, everything is maintained by our own employees. All the administrative functions from IT to finance to, to accounts payable, receivable, personnel, uh, properties, all those things are handled internally. We have a total of 126 full-time employees. Uh, we have an annual operating budget of about $25 million. We have no taxing power, and it was always one of my favorite parts of the speech when I talked to the public. So that $25 million budget is funded through our business operations. It's similar to the enterprise departments that some of you may manage with, uh, say, the water department, where they charge a fee instead of an ad valorem tax. The difference, though, is one of competition. In the case of the water department, you don't have five faucets there and say in the morning, you know, the water from uh, St. Petersburg is cheaper. I think I'll take a shower with St. Pete water or the water from Tampa tastes better. I'm going to drink that to drink my water. But in the case of the airport, you have a lot of choices as a consumer. You can go to our airport where you have a chance to make money on you if you use some of the services at the airport. But if you drive by our doorstep, you have a lot of other choices. You can go to Punta Gorda or Fort Myers to the south. You can go to St. Peter, Tampa to the north. And even Orlando International is about two hours away that you can go to the east. So if you drive by our doorstep, there's no way for us to reach into your pocket and say, we're good for the community, we're a big economic generator, and you should be contributing to our existence. So the only way that we get your, your business is when we provide you with a product that you want to buy at the airport. Now, we do receive capital grants from the state and federal government. Those grants come out of trust funds that are funded through two user fees, aviation fuel taxes and airline ticket taxes. And they go into trust funds at the state and federal level, and we compete with airports across the state and across the country for those grants. And we must contribute part of that money as well. It ranges anywhere from 5% to 50%, depending on the type of capital grants. It can only be used for capital construction. So we not only have to make enough money to operate the airport on an annual basis and pay our employees and that type of thing, but we also must have enough money to fund our share of capital improvements. Now, in 2019, I'm sorry, 2018, the Florida Department of Transportation did an economic impact study on all 20 commercial service airports in Florida. And that economic impact study revealed that little old SRQ 
has a $1.3 billion annual economic impact on this community with over 12,000 jobs derived from this community. So I'd like you to think about that for a second, that here is an organization, a government organization, that has a $1.3 billion positive economic impact on the community and does it at zero zero cost to the local taxpayer, and I think that's pretty good. Uh, as much as there are all a lot of government organizations in here, in my speeches to the general public, I usually tell them, name me another government organization that gives you over a billion dollars worth of value without taking at least two billion out of your pocket to do it with. But we're very proud of the fact that we have this kind of economic impact on the community, and we take it very seriously that part of our mission is to be an economic generator for the community. And I don't think there's a successful community in the United States that doesn't have a vibrant airport as one of its main facets. Now, we've seen a tremendous amount of growth in the last couple of years. In 2019, and this, this slide was done in December 2019, so we hadn't had the December figures in, shows a 40% increase there. Actually, we closed out uh, 2019 up 44.3%. Uh, the year before, we were up 16.1%. Over that two-year period, we're up 67%. So what we did, because that economic impact study was done in 2018, so we did another study to show what that increased traffic brought, and that brought another $309 million worth of economic impact. So we're now up to $1.65 million. Unfortunately, we added another 10 cities after that that equates to about this. So really, the airport now <coughs> has about a $2 billion a year annual economic impact on the community. As far as the authority finances go, uh, we're in an excellent position. Now, I know that I don't think any of the commissioners that are here today were on the board back when I came to the airport, and, and I had black hair at that time, too. Um, the, at that time, the county commissioners were worried that the airport would go into a financial emergency. And while uh, that wasn't a valid concern, in my opinion, uh, today nothing is, is along those lines. We have $24 million in reserves in investments. We have over $250 million worth of fixed assets. We have no debt. We made the last debt payment in August of 2014. Uh, we paid off $150 million worth of debt. Uh, there are very few airports in this country that have no debt. Uh, Tampa International is a wonderful airport. I worked there for three years, a beautiful airport. But if you go into their financials, they have $1.5 billion worth of debt on their books right now. Now, they have 22 million passengers to help pay that debt. but Nonetheless, they have a lot more debt than we do. We have signatory agreements with four airlines, Delta, American, JetBlue, and United. All that means is that they're committed to us till 2023. If they left before that, they'd still have to pay rent. Other airlines that we have do not are, operate as non-signatory. That allows them to come and go as they please, but they pay about a 20% premium uh, to operate at the airport. In 2017, we had a net surplus of 1.8 million approximately. 2018, it was 2.8 million approximately, and this year it was nearly <coughs> 4 million. All that goes back into our capital reserves, and that's how we help fund all those uh, capital programs that we do. So the airport's totally self-sufficient, has no debt, the facility, the physical facility is in excellent shape. We're investing about $20 million a year in the airport and capital improvements, and our air traffic is going up. So from the community standpoint, you have a very stable facility right now. As I said, not only did we pay off about $150 million worth of debt, we've made over $300 million worth of investments in the last 15 years without borrowing a dime to do that with. Uh, in 2018, we made $45 million worth of improvements. Uh, everything from the terminal roadside, curbside renovation, which allowed the curbside to have five lanes of contiguous traffic and some covered walkways. We built covered parking for $6.5 million uh, and have both shade parking and, and valet parking. Uh, we did the gateway signage project this past year out in front. Uh, we like to think that as we try to compete for traffic uh, and for the passengers, that your experience at the airport is kind of a boutique experience and one that's like more like going through a resort uh, than it is going through a, a government airport building. So uh, we wanted to take that kind of motif all the way out to the curb. So when you enter the airport, it kind of looks like you're coming to a, a country club or a resort uh, right from the curbside on in. We spent a million dollars to redo that, that, that intersection and, and the signage that are there. We also renovated the terminal between 2012 and 2016 completely. That was about a $25 million improvement. Everything from restrooms, the ticket wing, baggage wing, concourse, the aquarium, the roof. Uh, we put in new uh, chillers into the terminal. Everything at the airport, whether it's the roadway, the parking lot, the terminal, 
the airfield, all the lighting is now LED. Between that and what we put in was a magnetic bearing chillers. It was a new technology. It doesn't use oil. Therefore, you don't have to change them out every year and get them cleaned. You don't lose about 10% of the efficiency because the oil degrades. Uh, they're all magnetic bearing. They save about 25% on electricity. So over the last five years, our electric bills have gone from $1.1 million a year to $600,000 a year. So we've saved a lot of money doing that as well. We expanded our customs facility for about $4 million. We can handle 300 passenger peak hour in our customs facility. We're working very hard trying to get some overseas traffic, working with the Bradenton Area Convention and Visitors Bureau as well as, well as Visit Sarasota County. Uh, we built a new air traffic control tower last year. It was a $27 million investment, uh, an investment that was a one-third investment by the airport, a third by FDOT, and a third by the FAA. The reason we did that is there are 92 acres out in the infield that we wanted to develop over time, create more jobs, more economic impact. And unfortunately, where the old tower was, we couldn't build anything there because it would block the tower's view of the runway and you're not allowed to do that. So we first went with this. Uh, we just are completing $12 million worth of improvements on that 92 acres, roadway, sewer, water, electrical drainage, uh, so that we can go out there and try and find some big companies, whether it's an air cargo or, or major repair stations, and bring other high paying jobs to this community. We're also working with the Manatee County School District uh, on uh, building a hangar so we can have an A&P air, airframe and power plant school there, so we can have kids come out of school and go into jobs in, in, in airline mechanics that has an average starting salary of $62,000 a year. Uh, we also replaced our loading bridges this past year. They were 30 years old. That was a $13 million project. They're now completely air conditioned. The old ones weren't. They also have new APUs on them and, and air conditioning units for the aircraft as well. Other security improvements are another thing that have been a big not only uh, drag on the airport in the sense of the cost of it all, but one that takes up a lot of our thought processes because the safety and security of our passengers is always our highest priority. And it's always hard to keep ahead of the bad guys, as I know some of the police agencies in here will say the same thing. Staying ahead of terrorism is a very full-time job for us. Uh, we expanded our screening checkpoint from two to four lanes. That was about a $4 million project. And right now, today, uh, we're going through a design project, and we're going to do some adjustments to that will cost us about a million dollars and we're looking to do and add more lanes to that with this growth. Uh, we put in a new communications and emergency operations center, another $4 million project uh, with an access control system to all gates. We have 165 closed circuit television cameras throughout the airport. We can see every gate, every fence line, every door in the terminal, outside the terminal, in the parking lot. Uh, I always tell people, behave yourself, or you'll find yourself on YouTube the very next day because uh, we have 16 digital recorders going. This has been a very useful tool, not only uh, to watch what's going on in the airport, but for security. Our officers, when there's a call of a trouble someplace, our communication center can can zoom their cameras in on the situation, and they can give real-time updates to our police officers as to what's going on in that particular location at the time. Uh, we have a new inline baggage screening system that was built after 9-11. You may recall uh, right after 9-11, all the machines that screened baggage were out in the lobby and they would load them by hand, which meant they could clear about 130 bags per machine per hour. All those are behind the wall now. You just go up to the ticket counter like you did pre-9-11, drop your bag off. Uh, by putting them back there at a cost of about seven and a half million dollars, uh, that allows us to process over 400 bags per hour per machine. So we went from 330 bags an hour approximately to over 1,200 bags an hour. It's important to the consumer because you want to make sure their, air, their, their luggage gets on the plane that they're flying out on. The other thing we've done, and this goes back to that evolution of what's happening in terrorism and happening in, in just the world today, is we added some new ser terminal safety and security measures. You'll see in this picture, you'll see bollards in front of the doors. Now that was done after the Glasgow bombing because a car went through the doors in, in Glasgow, Scotland and blew up a, a, a bomb there. Also on that glass is a, is a film and we spent about a quarter of a million dollars on, uh, so that if there is a blast, the glass won't go flying. And that was uh, an injury report from the Brussels bombing that they had more injuries from glass flying. So we added that in another cost. And then the other thing we did about two years ago, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but you see this officer has a long gun. We've gone to have tactical patrols. Uh, the, the phenomenon of active shooter is one that uh, happens everywhere. Uh, and unfortunately, the sooner you can interdict with the active shooter, the sooner you can bring it to a conclusion. 
Unfortunately, officers with 9 millimeter handguns cannot interdict with a person with an AK-47 and an AR-15. So we always have, uh, at most times, an officer in tactical gear with a long rifle so that he or she can go and interdict with the active shooter immediately. And we have other long guns deployed in lockers around the airport that our other officers go and get and then can back them up. But they can meet with the same level of firepower. It was a change we did a couple years ago, uh, and it's one that uh, we were a little worried about of how people will receive that. And, and I can report to you that people love it. 99% of the time I, I can see people come up to our officers that have that and, and thank them for being there to protect them. So people understand the changing dynamic in this world. Uh, from an air service standpoint, we've had a lot of success in the last couple of years. Allegiant started service in April of, nine, of 2018 with three cities, Cincy, Pittsburgh, and Indianapolis. They added nine more cities in the winter spring of 2019. And then they started in the fall of 2019 with eight more cities. So they're now up to 21 nonstop destinations. Sun Country just started this December with nonstop service to Minneapolis. American added Chicago, Dallas, and Philadelphia. Frontier Airlines came in at the <coughs> Cleveland, Philly, Atlanta, and Trenton. United added a second flight, daily flight to Newark, added some Denver service in March, uh, and added two-time daily service to Washington, Dulles, as well as their Chicago service. And then Elite Airways added Traverse City. So this was our airline service map in 20, March of 2018, just about two years ago to this day. And as you can see, we had six airlines and 11 nonstop destinations. Today, this is what our service map looks like. So it's been, thank you, it's, it's been a, a lot of work and it's been, it's been very gratifying. And, and just a couple things that I'd like to talk about on air services. The efforts we make, we talk to airlines all the time. And we work with both convention and visitors bureaus and have great working relationships with them. The airport offers an incentive package to any airline for any new service of operating at the airport for that service for free for two years. So you can't get any cheaper than free. We also partner with the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureaus on marketing support for those new services as well. So with those combinations, it's been very successful. The other thing is that despite what you might have heard, the reason that we have the level of air service we have is because of the number of people we have in the area and what the level of demand for tourism is. It is not what the airport charges. For my entire career, I've been at that airport when I had black hair and it was 25 years ago, uh, our, our rates and charges were always less than Tampa's and Fort Myers. Our rates and charges right now are anywhere from 40 to 75% less than Tampa and Fort Myers. Airlines do not pick service areas based on what an airport charges. Airport charges only make up 4 or 5% of the cost. Their cost is in fuel, personnel, and aircraft. They make their decision on, on what the market can support. And I often tell people when I give speeches that if you want the service of a Tampa International, then you have to march down to these county commission meetings and yell at all these commissioners to do away with development rules, get 2 million more people in here, and you'll have a Tampa International. Now, none of you will want to live here, but you'll have a TAMP International. You have a great level of service at our airport. You can get virtually anywhere in the world, most of the time with just one stop, because you have a lot of great services at hub airports, and we have a lot of good nonstop service now to the Midwest and the Northeast, and we're working our way west. So I, I like to kind of say we're kind of a boutique airport. Uh, Tampa's like Publix. It's got a lot of choices. Uh, Fort My or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Punta Gorda and St. Peter like save a lot. They got one airline, you can cut your rates. And we're kind of like Whole Foods, all right? So we give you that high-end boutique experience. Now, the only thing I ask of people in the community and in this room is to check us first. About half the time we can meet your needs, and the other half of the time we can't. It's not because of something the airport's doing. It's because this is what the marketplace is, and this is the level of service <laughs> that airlines can make profit do profitably. So uh, all I ask you to do is check us first and think of a couple things. Think about when you take your cost of your trip from the time you leave your door till the time you get back to your door, not from when you lift off the runway till the time you touch down. Because a lot of cases, if the, if the fee and the ticket is 50, 75, or $100 more out of SRQ than it is out of another airport, you haven't saved any real money once you drive up there, spend money on a tank of gas, it's about $5 a day more to park there. Or if you use a taxi or a limousine service, it's about 100 bucks each way. All right. Secondly, think about your time. Now, it used to be a little easier to get up there. 
and now it's a lot harder to get up there. So most people have to leave three or four hours before their flight if they're going somewhere else. So you really haven't saved any time because usually your connections in other airports are only an hour to 90 minutes. And then finally, I'd like you to hear this, a day in the airport, a day in the life of the airport. Oh, it's there. 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 Sarasota Bradenton Air Traffic Control Tower is open. Good morning, everyone. Center Bridge Control Tower. Good night. Thank you. We're, we're real proud of that video. We, we think it evokes a little emotion. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I thank you again for the opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hopes? Mike? Sure. <laughs> I really want to commend you for your leadership and your business acumen and your, your diligence towards customer service. I visit airports around the world, um, and at, at your airport, I've been a tenant. Uh, uh, and uh, when I first moved here, I kept, still kept a plane up in Tampa, and I don't know why I kept driving up there. Uh, and then, as you know, you know, moved moved one down here, and uh, whether it's whether it's coming in, there's rarely a delay in getting an approach and landing. I think I've only hit a bird once on landing. I think John Cologne was in the plane with me at the time. Uh, but recently, I've started to fly in and out of there, uh, both to the West Coast and then Boston and D.C., and it has been fantastic. I mean, I probably fly out of SRQ now commercially probably 80% of my flights, uh, and it is an incredibly pleasant experience. Uh, I mean, just everything you're doing, 
uh, really reflects well on our region. And if, if you haven't been using the airport, uh, I can tell you the, the, the prices now are so close in comparison to Tampa. And it's, it's a much better service. It's, it's pleasant. It's efficient. Uh, and I really, really commend you because it, it, it really is the gateway to our community. And it, it demonstrates the level of excellence that, that we can deliver to businesses and, and visitors. So, so thank you for your, your good work. Well, thank you. Uh, I really want to give credit to the team of people that we have. Uh, this is my fourth airport. And all the airports are to have excellent people. But this is the most talented group of people I've had the pleasure to work with. And, and they really understand the customer service issues that we face. That's great. Misty? Yes, um, thank you for being here and the great presentation. And congratulations on achieving what you told us or what I heard you say 15 or more years ago <laughs> that you would achieve. Um, you told us this was coming, and now you did yeah. it. So I'd like to ask you, where do you see the airport five years from now? Uh, we're actually going through a master plan process now, which is a, something the FAA mandates every 10 years. It's about a million-dollar effort going through this master planning process. We expect to be up double digits again this year, probably in the 20 to 25% range, not the 45% ranges uh, that we have been experiencing. Uh, and the, the facility's in good shape. The, the efforts will be, as we look at the master plan, what are the future growth projections? And then when do we have to do things like add more parking or a parking garage? Do we have to add another wing to the terminal? And how will we finance that? Because uh, while we're very proud and, and guard very cautiously the, the debt-free status we have, if another wing of the terminal was needed, that's probably the 80 to $100 million range. We'd have to go out on the marks in a revenue bond. So it wouldn't be a bond that, that brings any, any obligation to the counties. It would be a bond based on the revenue the airport generates and would be some, something in the debt market. But uh, uh, we're, in, we're in good shape. But th that's where I see it going. I think we'll continue to grow. Uh, the, the community certainly has, has jumped the shark when it comes to that. Uh, when we go out and talk to airlines, there's a couple big statistics that get their attention. One is that this community has grown at 20,000 people a year for the last five years. So that's a small city every year being added to our, our bi-county community. Uh, and then secondly, uh, with about 4,000 new uh, hotel rooms in the last couple of years, it might not sound like a lot until you transfer it into room nights. That's over a million room nights. Wow. And when you tell airline planners that you have a million room nights more than you had two years ago, uh, that gets their attention, and, and they usually think, well, Mr. Marriott and Mr. Hilton are stupid. They're not building that just for, for the sake of building. There's got to be the demand there. I, I think the biggest thing that happened, though, is when Allegiant came in and showed how fast they grew, other airlines took notice of it because we had been saying the same thing for 15 years. If you bring the service, it'll get, it'll get patronized. And when Allegiant grew so fast, it made the others try and play catch up. And everything that they've done so far, every one of the airlines and every route that they've tried, they've been very satisfied with. So none of them are performing bad, and, and that makes them look at more and more, and we expect to see more growth in the future. Um, thank you. I'd also like to hear your opinion on, on what you project is going to happen with coronavirus and travel to Sarasota. Uh, we're watching it closely. Uh, it's affecting overseas travel right now, so it's not uh, our travels mostly domestic. Although we have five to seven percent of people will end up going internationally to other destinations. Um, I think if it lasts a long time, it'll have some effect, and, and it'll be interesting to see. It's having an effect on airlines as they cancel more of their services, obviously to China, uh, South Korea, Italy, that type of thing. Uh, we're hoping that for the short term, what it does is free up aircraft that so they can add more domestic flights here. But if it continues, it certainly will have an impact on the airport as it will on all our businesses. Uh, and because we are truly a business, uh, uh, that affects our bottom line. I, I tend to say to people, we're kind of like the mob. We get a piece of the action of everything that happens at the airport. If you buy a Coke, we get a percentage of that. If you buy a shirt, we get a percentage of that. We get a percentage of when you rent a car. We get parking fees when you park your car. Uh, we get airline rents. And, and so there's not, there's not anything that happens on the airport that we don't get a piece of the action on. Uh, and so uh, when there's less people, there's less action. So. Right. Okay, great. Uh, Vanessa. Yeah, um, you know, the term boutique airport, I think, is so correct. Uh, 
I mean, every time I ever go there, and I always try to fly out of, of Sarasota uh, Bradenton Airport, um, it, it's such a great experience. It is no stress. It's easy. It's relaxing. It's a great way to start a trip. So keep it up. I think it's great. And you know, with the comment that you just made about uh, the coronavirus, I was thinking actually that some of these um, international trips, you know, are being canceled, um, you know, and, and right, rightfully so. So maybe people will say, you know what, we need to stay in the States and yeah. go on vacation here instead of going overseas this year. So maybe well, it'll increase. We're, you know? we're certainly hoping, but that, yeah. that will depend on how that control is in the United States as to whether it spreads that much. In It'll the be US better than not. China and Japan but, uh, and Italy. We try to give that relaxing experience, and that's one of the reasons we're actually working on trying to expand our security checkpoint. One of the challenges we face, uh, we're up nearly uh, 700,000 passengers in a year. So one of the challenges we face is how do we keep that boutique experience while seeing this phenomenal growth. We were either the number one or number two fastest growing airport in the United States this past year. So uh, it presents a different set of challenges. The type yeah, we like, but a good. different set of challenges. Yeah. We're very proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, as a close neighbor to your airport, I am very aware of your <laughs> success. You Keep that. it up. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I do want to emphasize from an operations standpoint, uh, we actually have 60,000 less operations than we had in 1999 as far as oh. airfield operations go. Oh. Uh, oh. So we're 30% or 33% less than we did in 1999 when there were stage two aircraft, not stage three, four, and five aircraft. So uh, our noise contours are much smaller than they were in those days. Uh, and I, I'd like to remind the county commission, since it went through, we went through a DRI, uh, that the airport spent $45 million on noise mitigation in the community. Uh, so we've met all our obligations. We're card-carrying members of the whitfield Ballantyne Home Homeowners Association. We try to be great neighbors. Yeah, I, I live south, so I hear that uh, 6 a.m. flight that's the Legion. I, yeah, I think it's 5.50 it, or 5 5 5. It is a great flight. I have taken it. I love it, the nonstop to Flint, Michigan. I'm just so grateful Good. for it, but I do hear it at my home when I, they are I, revving I that engine up. So. Well, I get it on the north side. <laughs> so, All right. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, no it. other questions? Thanks. Thank you. All thank right. You, we're gonna, moving right along. We're going to go to our post-disaster redevelopment plan update. I see Nicole Knapp coming forward. And we also have Jerry Murphy from the University of Florida. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicole Knapp, Planning Manager with the Public Safety Department Emergency Management Division. Um, as some of you may remember, we were here before you about 13 months ago. And at that time, we provided an overview of the Parallel Flood Implementation Grant Project that we had with Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. We also explained our collaboration to support the Regional Resiliency Coalition. And we discussed the over-encompassing topic of uh, inc increasing resiliency in our community. Jerry Murphy from the University of Florida's College of Design, Construction, and Planning Resilient Communities Initiative is here with us again today, this time to provide an update on the 2015 Peril of Flood legislation, our efforts thus far with our gap analysis and suggested policy language moving forward, um, a sea level rise estimates, which is an ever-changing target in a faster, more, more dangerous direction. So we need to prepare, and now is the time to prepare. And to discuss how this all dovetails into the update of our Manatee County Post-Disaster Redevelopment Plan. Through the update of the PDRP, we need to increase awareness and understanding among our residents, businesses, as well as all of our stakeholders involved, moving forward as a community with this impending circumstance. Now is the time to get involved, to be engaged, so watch for communication over the next few weeks on how you can help with local participation that all being said, I'll turn it over to Jerry. Thank you, Nicole. For the record, Jerry Murphy with the University of Florida. Um, it didn't seem to me like it had been 13 months since we were last here. But I'm happy to be back with the Council of Governments. <coughs> now I just have to figure out how this works. Okay, 
So your comprehensive plan every seven years has to be updated. It's called an evaluation and appraisal report or an EAR. Um, the counties is due. There's first a letter that's sent, and that's due at the end of this year. And then you have a year to update your comprehensive plan. I've listed the municipalities on the right-hand side. They generally follow, although a couple of the com uh, communities on the barrier island of Anna Maria have already done updates. And I think they have been found um, peril of flood compliant. But we still want them to engage in this effort because we're trying to be comprehensive throughout the community and through the county. And hopefully there'll be um, things that can be taken away to improve those comprehensive plans. Because resiliency planning is a reiterative process, always ongoing. We get done with one year, there's another year coming seven years later. And the legislature, in their infinite wisdom, is always providing new directives for local governments to uh, improve themselves. <clears throat> so for the peril of flood update, um, we're looking basically the graphic with the colors shows the uh, various aspects of the coastal areas of the county and their different uh, inundation possibilities over the next uh, 80 years now. <clears throat> and the legislature, when they passed the peril of flood requirements, hung them in the coastal management element of the comprehensive plan in the redevelopment component that was originally the post-disaster redevelopment plan. And so the dovetailing of the peril of flood updates with the update of the peril, I'm sorry, with the update of the post-disaster redevelopment plan uh, is very timely. And it's basically looking at coastal areas. And these are the six requirements for peril of flood. Um, the four, five, and six basically are pretty much language that was added during the legislative process that the communities are generally already in compliance with. So the focus of the update is on the first three, which includes basically strategies related to dealing with sea level rise, encouraging the removal of coastal real property from flood zone designations, and site development and uh, best practices to reduce flood losses and insurance claims. So I'll go through this quickly in the uh, interest of time. You've got a full package and I think a PDF as well that you can look at otherwise. Um, but this is basically the first one, the second one, and the third one that I mentioned. And then you've got a requirement to be engaged with floodplain regulations in the building code and in the National Flood Insurance Program that's in the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. You need to regulate construction in the coastal construction control line, which you do anyway. Um, and then you're in to encourage local governments to participate in the community rating system. And then Manatee County is now a five. That's basically 25% discount on flood insurance because of the community rating system. Um, we're suggesting as we go through this participative uh, project, project <clears throat> that the local governments that were involved in the local mitigation strategy update continue to be involved and we'll try and use that platform so that we have quarterly meetings that folks are kind of already used to doing. One of the things that we might build upon, we're talking about this internally now, is in the community rating system program, the CRS program, there is a requirement or a potential for points if you do a program for public information, which is a PPI. And we're hoping to coordinate on a countywide basis with the municipalities in that program to get those extra points. Uh, you've recently had a coastal study update for the flood insurance rate maps. And these are the um, areas that we're focused on there. You can see as the panels get more granular, they're getting much more close to the coast. This is then a graphic that shows the three level, three foot sea level rise estimate. When that's going to happen is open to debate. It seems that every time there's a report released, it's sooner and sooner, but it is going to happen. And so we have to prepare for that. Um, this is the coastal planning area that the county has identified, utilizing the slosh models and the evacuation levels of one, two, and three. And this will be the coastal area that we're gonna focus on with regard to the peril of flood update. Um, we're working very closely with DEP. We, get, we had a grant through the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council that Nicole mentioned, and we have applied for another grant to um, help with the vulnerable communities aspect. Those are areas where um, People have lower incomes or are vulnerable for uh, ADA. Um, hopefully we'll get that grant and that can support 
further planning in this regard. So the past disaster redevelopment plan, as I've mentioned before, Manatee County is one of five pilot communities, and Manatee developed its adopted PRD, PDRP, excuse me, uh, 2008 to 2009. About eight years later, um, University of Florida conducted an audit of that plan and provided uh, recommendations for the update that we're now involved with. Uh, that's the audit. And we came up with a set of 14 recommendations. Three of those that are highlighted were um, supported by the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council grant. And so we've moved quite a good distance on those and the rest we're working on now as part of the update. Um, we have just completed the um, peril of flood gap analysis with county staff and we'll be now moving on to the um, drafting of policy language for consideration by staff administration and ultimately for the Board of County Commissioners. And hopefully that language as it's developed will be language that the local governments, the municipalities can use in their comprehensive plans if they choose to. Um, we note that increased flooding has had a tremendous impact in the Tampa Bay Regional Council area. Uh, nearly one million, I'm sorry, one billion dollars. Um, and so these are some of the resilience knowledge building activities that we've accomplished thus far. And what we're hoping to do is increase upon the regional benefits that the grant provided and also upon the Manatee County benefits, which provided a much greater uh, strengthening of communication among the various departments of staff in terms of recognizing this sort of existential challenge that we're facing with sea level rise. So the gap analysis has been completed. So the next steps will be the update of the PDRP, integrating the PDRP with the comprehensive plan, which is how the legislature has done that now that they've called the redevelopment component of the coastal management element where the PDRP hangs. Um, we're gonna update the comprehensive plan as part of the evaluation and appraisal review to comply with the parallel flood requirements. We're going to then engage community engagement, have public hearings and ordinance adoption, and then subsequent amendment to the land development regulations, which come a year after the evaluation and appraisal based changes have been approved by the state. Um, again, these are the dates, and you have this again for your ready reference. I want to mention briefly that we're also working with the National Preparedness System in terms of the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan and how that can come into an overarching comprehensive plan. Uh, I won't go through this in great detail, but there is uh, information for you uh, in your handout. Okay. Don't know how I did that. <laughs> Got real-time bus information. Yeah, we'll incorporate that somehow, too. <laughs> Help me out. Which slide were you on? I was right at the end. I apologize for the technical difficulties, or whatever I did. Okay. So this is an outline of the National Preparedness System. Uh, it establishes national planning frameworks, and those address the five pillars, you might say, of the National Preparedness System. <clears throat> the prevention framework, the protection framework, mitigation framework, response framework, and hopefully we'll have less and less to do with the recovery framework. Anyway, the last slide is for questions, and that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right, we have a lot of information, and Nicole, I guess we're going to be discussing this more in detail as we move toward the EAR. Is that correct? That's correct. We have until December 1st to um, send our commitment letter to DEO for the EAR. Um, and so we're working to draft the policy language over this next spring and then start working with the public through the summer and the fall. So you'll probably see the actual public hearing portions um, first quarter of next year is what we're estimating. Okay. 
All right, and uh, Nicole's a great resource. I know the cities are um, dealing with this as well, so if you have any questions. It's just kind of late in the day. We're probably all a little brain dead at this point, unfortunately. <laughs> but it uh, looks like a great presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, next up, our own Damon Moore, Ecological and Marine Resources Division Manager for Manatee Parks and Natural Resource Department, is going to talk about the history and future restoration of Manatee River oyster habitat. This is good news. All right, so I'm glad to be here. Um, as, as Betsy mentioned, I'm Damon Moore, so I'm going to run through this as quick as I can and try to keep it as exciting as possible. So um, real quick, what I'll go over here is um, I'll talk a little bit about the history of oysters in the Manatee River, something a lot of people don't know about. Um, I'll go over some recent oyster restoration projects that uh, Manatee County has taken on and talk about some conceptual plans, especially kind of make everybody aware and let you know where the Parks and Natural Resources Department is looking to go in the next five to ten years with some large-scale oyster habitat restoration projects around here. So really quick before we go, so that this makes a lot more sense to everybody real quick, um, I'll give you the really, really abbreviated version is um, oysters have a larval phase that float around in the water. When that larval phase lands on something hard, they grow into a large oyster. You pass biology, good job. <laughs> um, another something to preface it with that's, that's important is the concept of shifting baselines. This is basically that, that things, um, things that we think are normal now aren't necessarily normal in, as, the, the, as they were in the past. Um, this is particularly important when it comes to oysters because most of the damage was done to the oysters before 1900. So I know you talked about some gray hairs in here. None of them, nobody in here has enough gray hairs to remember any of that. Probably your parents either. So going on to that, um, I took a deep dive into history to look into this project. And this is about as far back as I'll go with it. But 1793, um, this is a letter from, of two Spaniards to each other about their travels here in Manatee County. Um, at that time, it was called Tala Chakpu, which was the Manatee River. Um, that's what the Indians called it. The Spaniards called it River of Oysters on the account of the many which blocked its entrance. Um, move forward a little bit further. Some of the very early maps of our area. This is from 1837. Um, you'd notice that it wasn't called the Manatee River at that time. It was called the Oyster River. So from an ecological restoration point of view, there's some pretty big clues that oyster restoration is a pretty viable option because there's a lot more of it and the giant mounds of them at the mouth at Emerson Point. Um, just another, this is from the Spanish land grants, um, also referring to this as the Oyster River. Um, but these are where it gets a little bit more interesting. This is from the, uh, the United States Fish Commission and you'll notice that the date on here is 1898. So this was basically the predecessor of NOAA. They were going out specifically to identify what was going on with natural resources in our area. So the, the important parts here is when, when they came across to the big and little Manatee Rivers and further south, um, everywhere they found the same condition. Oysters, oysters everywhere. But then the next line, again, this was 1898. How little did I know, had I think, that in less than 25 years, every one of these bars would be partially or totally depleted. So this was the first one of those references I found. And again, this was way before anybody was even thinking about paying attention to this stuff. So I wondered why, because most people think Apalachicola. So I found this really interesting thing through, you can you basically search all of these old newspapers now and find all kinds of amazing cool stuff. <laughs> so with this one, when I type in manatee and oyster, um, from 1876, um, this basically says a weekly line of steam steamships were coming f to New Orleans and Havana. Um, from Tampa, Manatee, Key West, with oysters and fish. So we had an industry going here pretty strong then. Um, again, this is 1887, heavy shipments of oysters being made from Palmasola. So right there on the river, we're shipping these things out way back then. 
then this is a little bit more of a specific call out. Once they realized that these oyster resources were being heavily depleted, uh, Mr. Mr. Rouge, which is famous in Apalachicola parts, but basically said that Florida, especially with all her experience of the past to profit, is destroying her natural resources. Um, and also mentioning that canneries were built here and canneries on the Manatee River. Again, this is 1897. So this is, this is why the shifting baseline thing was an, an important pass, because nobody remembers oysters being this good because none of us were around. Um, this is another one. This basically goes over looking into the, how, how you would look to restore these oyster grounds. But um, it was basically saying that we would go and harvest all these oysters and not replenish those beds to put culch material back down to grow another crop. So it's not, it's not a new problem that we didn't know about. It's been going on for a long time. But this is where it got personal. So in 1900, again in the Savannah Morning News, they wrote specifically called us out. <laughs> the Manatee Journal, oyster culture should receive large attention by property owners on the waters of Manatee County. The natural beds have been destroyed, and for several years, supply must be very limited. So... 1900, they were saying, okay, we've got an oyster problem here. But that wasn't enough. We kept going. So this is a, a, a part of an interview with a, a John Glazier. Um, this, this basically says, John Glazier remembered the Manatee Avenue was originally a sandy road, which was eventually paved with live oyster shells. Not, not just the shells on the sides of the bank, but they'd pull the live ones out of the river, pave the, pave the roads with them, it says that for several months after this paving, the oyster meat rotted, and Manatee oh. Avenue was the most odiferous street in the whole United <laughs> States. So we're famous. <laughs> so it wasn't just physical removal of these things. As this population was going, we didn't have all of these wonderful sewage treatment plants. And I found this map in Bradenton, and there was this one little thing there that kind of caught my eye because I had no clue what it was. But this is down Riverside Drive there. Um, it was this Imhoff tank. And there was a lot of confusion. A lot of people, this structure was still down there at least a couple years ago. I don't know if it's still there or not. But um, a lot of people thought it was an old dance floor and they used to hide moonshine under there. But it was a, a very rudimentary sewage treatment plant. So it basically held it there for a little while and then off into the river. Raw sewage and oysters don't mix well, so that was one of the reasons our increasing population with zero sewage treatment plant really took its toll on oyster habitat. So this is an interesting picture. This is looking down 10th Street with the, the Hampton there. Not Well, it is now, but um, I just like looking at old pictures from this area, and this one caught my eye because there's a great big dump truck full of oyster shells right there downtown. So I was wondering what that was about. I um, came across this. This is basically a list of the severance records where oyster shell, culch material, where these would grow back, had been mined off the bottom of the Manatee River between 1931 and 1963. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the, on the bottom there, the cubic yard total is 651,000 plus or minus cubic yards of shell material that was dredged off the river and sold for all kinds of different things, road-based, building materials, all kinds of things. Um, but we got $62,000 in severance paid back for that, so that didn't quite even it out. I can't quite fix the problem with that much. Um, but it was interesting. I worked with the Florida Department of Historical Resources, and they actually dug up the actual mining leases and provided maps to show where in Bradenton these were drawn out from, and this is basically what the operation looked like. Um, this was from uh, the photos from 1972, but basically the oyster dredge would just come up, pull the stuff off the river, set it onto a barge, and then um, into Bradenton, and then sold for all sorts of good stuff. Um, but it's interesting because that picture is very similar to what the restoration project looks like, except for you load it up with some kind of cult material, come and, and dump it back out. So, and this is the other one, um, we all like drinking water, it's a good thing for us, but that alters the hydrology of the river, and oysters are specific to a specific area that has so much fresh water. So it basically took the sweet spot for oysters, and instead of it being at the mouth of the river, it drew it up a little bit further, so now the really good areas are like Braden to City of Bradenton, um, back up to a little bit, say, uh, east of the Braden River. 
So there's the bad news. That's how we destroyed everything. So we've been working, trying to do some oyster projects, uh, mimicking a lot of the successes of other areas. So um, we, we've been doing these at Robinson Preserve since Robinson Preserve started. So this aerial just shows you kind of the, the progression of things. And you'll see the, uh, the, the green polygons. Um, these are areas that are oyster bars now, but you'll see in 2004, they weren't even waterways yet. So 2013, after the ecological enhancements, but we hadn't put any of this culch material down yet to grow new oysters. Um, we kind of came across this because we realized any place in Robinson Preserve where we had bridge abutments or rocks or anything going to the edge of the water, oysters recruited on those naturally. So it was kind of a, a, a light bulb went off and said, if we want more oysters, we just need to put some hard substrate down. So we got a couple of grants and said, we'll do this as a test pilot project to see how this works in our area. So we filled in all the gaps there, and this is, um, you see, we've got about a full acre of them that we did within Robinson Preserve, and this was all painstakingly done with a lot of sweat and volunteers. Um, I know some of you guys helped with that, out here, even in this crowd. Um, but this was basically the process as we go out, find the right elevation, stake it out, get a bunch of bagged up shell, get a whole bunch of happy volunteers loaded out there, and now we've got, at a low tide, if you go out there, Every bit of that is covered with all of these oysters, which is really good for us, especially since we care so much about water quality in our area because these oysters are adding to the water quality benefits by constantly filtering materials out. I have a little bit more of a personal love for them because anybody who likes to go out chasing after snook or redfish knows you look after these things. So the more of these we put out there, the more redfish I can go chase after. And I need to check every bar we ever do. <laughs> So this is the, the typical graphic you'll see that floats around everywhere, but um, the, the number I don't agree with. I think some better science needs to be done, but they'll say an oyster can filter 50 gallons of water per day. I think it's less than that, and there's a whole lot of variables that need to be worked out, but that's a really easy number to do calculations from. So I'm going to run that through. So looking at that Robinson project, if we did an oyster, um, we, uh, we have about 10 oysters per square feet out there. What it basically ends up out to is that every single day, those oysters at Robinson Preserve that were put out by volunteers filter the equivalent of 33 Olympic swimming pools worth of water, which is a pretty impressive feat, considering if you had to pay for a filter that would do that sort of thing in your, in your pool. So looking into the future um, and, and realizing that the, the history of oysters in the Manatee River, we'd like to kind of go big, do this like they've done in Texas and in the Panhandle and, and bring some of this style project to, to, to Manatee County. Um, and really, this, 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 the next couple of aerials shows like some of the areas with high potential. Uh, so this is just an example. This is right if you're on the south side of the river on I-75 as you're going north. Um, we've got these really shallow banks, and then if you look close and go out there on a boat, there's actually oyster bars that are on those banks in some areas out there that are right against the mangrove shorelines that are coming in. So the typical areas where they, they want to be in this shallower water, in this kind of hydrology, but you can just make note of that kind of light brown between the mangrove fringe and the deeper water, that's kind of the sweet spot where oyster restoration is a good possibility. So noting that, that aerial signature and that light brown color, the area in the yellow box is what was in the previous photo. You can see that there is a lot of potential. So I've been talking about the, the potential of this project in our area with a lot of different stakeholders um, for a couple of years. And finally, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program said, Damon, start putting a map together. Like, how much area would be possible? Like, what's the highest thing? So deep into the night, me on Google Maps drawed out every single polygon along the Manatee River that I thought had potential. And there's a total of 475 acres in there that could potentially, that should be looked at very closely to do oyster habitat restoration on. That's a lot of water quality if you can, or water quality benefit and habitat benefit if you're able to pull something like that off. Larger projects have been done in other areas. So looking along those same, like using that same kind of calculation for water filtration, um, what this basically comes down to, doing the same calculations we applied to the one acre, if we did 
475 acres, that's 15,669 swimming pools of water per day. And I'm sure every one of you knows exactly what that would look like. So since that's really hard to conceptualize, I, I, I'd change that up a little bit. So if you consider that from the I-75 bridge out to the mouth of the river, there's about 51,000 feet there. It's about 10 feet deep. It's about 4,500. There's about 17.17 billion gallons of water. Given the filtration rate, if you, if you populated 475 acres, all of that water could be filtered in two days by having that much out there. So there's a lot of potential benefit that we could do. Um, and then there's a litany of other benefits that come from oysters, especially habitat, shrimps, all this stuff here. You can, you can read this. But um, that's it. But the one thing, too, is that the, tip, the question that typically comes up is like, well, I saw my doc was on that one. This is all very conceptual at this point. We're, we're just trying to build partnership and look into what we can kind of build together. If, if other, I know City of Palmetto is already looking at some oyster projects. Um, the river walk stuff would be great with some oyster projects out there too. Um, and when we would go into permitting this, we, we, we wouldn't want this to impact riparian rights of anybody. So that would definitely be taken into consideration as we worked into a permitting phase with this. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Hey, very exciting. Best presentation of the day. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, Brown, I mean. You had mentioned about uh, Tampa Bay, but have you talked with Sarasota Bay? Estuary? Yes, but, but okay. we've, I've been in discussions with both estuary programs and FWC, and I'm a part of the, it's called the Oyster Integrated Monitoring and Mapping Network. So I gave this presentation for two of the meetings in a row now, but it's basically the oyster people of the United States all come together. And um, the, the, one of the reasons I started putting that out early is to just kind of start identifying red flags that would go up that I'd be like, okay, well, we better think on how we would deal with that. And um, so far, it's, it's, it's gonna, uh, permitting is going to be a challenge because obviously it's in the water. But other than that, it's, um, surprisingly, it's been done in other places already. So. And also part of our Riverwalk East in the city of Bradenton, there is a project that talked about on that point where you said the sewage part of it was. That's been discussed, and we are going to be getting some stuff back probably in the next few months about the project going east there. Well, and the, yeah. any, if any, anybody has any of these oyster projects, um, make sure you have my contact info. Mm -hmm. ha have your people coordinate with me because there may be opportunities where we can bundle some of these projects together and use that all as local match and get some larger money that we're, we're trying to get broken loose on this too. All right. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, great presentation. Thank Love you. history. That was amazing. All right, presentation of the school districts, I think it meant draft, not daft, 2020-2022 uh, strategic plan. Let's see. Uh, uh, Kevin Chapman, the director of strategic planning and district initiatives for the school district of Manatee County. I'm now the guy between you and going home and watching Super Tuesday results. So uh, we're, which I know is exciting, right? Um, I, we're joined here by three of our board members, uh, Chair Gina Messenger, uh, board member Charlie Kennedy, and board member Dr. Scott Hopes, and our superintendent, Cynthia Saunders. Uh, we are uh, in the phase of creating a new strategic plan for the school district. Our last one went from 2015 to 2000, 2015, 2019, so it ended this year. Uh, we have, uh, are in the initial stages of a strategic plan. We just presented it to uh, our board uh, for the first board workshop uh, with probably a few more workshops to go uh, with the goal of uh, getting it approved by the school board uh, before uh, the next uh, school year, which uh, is, is August. Um, I would mention uh, just a few facts before I just kind of run through this real quick. Um, is, is the current state of the school district. Uh, as many of you know, we are the largest employer in Manatee County. 8,000 employees, 50,000 students, 58 facilities, uh, very large. Uh, it's a $900 million budget. Uh, and so a strategic plan for that size of an organization is, is pretty important. Uh, in 2015, we were ranked uh, 40 
40th uh, in the state out of 67 school districts. Uh, in 2019, we were ranked 28th. With the, the momentum and the positive uh, success of this school district uh, is, is really something to take note of. We're a half a point away from being an A-rated school district by the Florida Department of Education. Uh, and uh, those kind of um, uh, current state and, and the fact that we want to be the number one school district in the state of Florida uh, is, is, is a real positive uh, foundation to build a strategic plan from. So as we look at a strategic plan, and, and obviously you all in here support the school district in any, many ways, and we appreciate that, um, you, you, we've got to start looking at, obviously, um, all of the initiatives that we're doing in our school district. We have, if you, I know you can't really see this, the slide on your right, but I'll just point out one fact, which is at Palm View Elementary, which is now Palm View K-8, uh, we have worked with uh, Steve Wozniak, who's the co-founder of Apple Computers, to create the first Woz school. It's, you know, obviously using his last name, uh, the Woz Ed School. It's a STEM-type school. It's the first one in the state of Florida. Uh, there's not many in the country. Uh, and, and it's these kind of initiatives that are really going to put, uh, really make Manatee County the best school district in the state of Florida. So we look to continue those type of innovative initiatives that n really no other school district is doing in the state of Florida. But as I, obviously the millage that we all know uh, has, was passed in 2018 is a very big step in uh, creating more STEM and science and math and engineering programs around the district. Uh, we look forward to obviously that coming up for a vote again uh, in, in early 2022. But we obviously in this strategic plan want to show the success of the millage has had so far in our students. Um, but obviously I'm not going to go through every page here. It's 540 right now. But uh, uh, on this page, what's important is, is our uh, work with the Suncoast uh, campaign for grade level reading uh, and our work with United Way on that. Uh, obviously, to, to have students be on grade level reading by the time they enter the fourth grade is vital to their success. It, 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 the percentages show that it's pretty much almost guarantees a graduation on time. So uh, that, that's a huge effort for us. Uh, and, and we're one of very few counties, uh, school districts uh, in the state of Florida who have uh, a, a pre-K, voluntary pre-K program. Uh, it's something that uh, the Florida Council of 100 in their 2040 project pointed out as their number one uh, really beacon, their number one goal to see in the school system in Florida is voluntary pre-K uh, and to get our students reading uh, at a very, very young age. Obviously, safety and security is a, is a huge concern. Safety is really that mental health side, that social emotional learning. Uh, the superintendent has made it one of her top priorities uh, is to really make social emotional learning part of our curriculum across the entire school district. Uh, on the security side, we're obviously doing everything uh, we need to do legislatively and beyond that. If you were to ask safe schools right now, the division of Florida Department of Education security side, they would say that Manatee County is far uh, ahead of almost all the school districts in the state of Florida when it comes to security and fencing and cameras and the Guardian program. Obviously, our work with uh, our, our police departments is so important with our SRO program. So obviously, all the law enforcement in the building, thank you uh, for, for all your help on that. We, we've uh, recently, last year, hired uh, a new chief technology officer uh, who is really, uh, with the guidance of uh, the school board, uh, and really the superintendent's leadership has is, is really made and is going to make our school district one of the most technologically advanced school districts. Uh, and, and as we all know how important that is in education. And our work with Samsung and uh, many of the technology com companies is, is really uh, something that uh, has really put Manatee County school system on the map. So we're going to be looking to expand that. Uh, obviously, fiscal responsibility uh, is, is obviously important as we all run huge uh, organizations, but also on capital planning. As you all know, we've built three new schools uh, in, the, in the county, and over the next couple of years, we're, we're looking to spend, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, several hundred millions of dollars on, on upgrading and improving our schools to really make them uh, 21st century schools, and then look at those growth numbers that we all know are happening in the county to see where we need to build schools next. 
Uh, obviously, this is a huge important uh, recruitment and retention uh, with 8,000 employees and growing, 50,000 students and growing, uh, and the need for teachers, as we all know, we read that in the newspaper every day, uh, to make Manatee County a destination for teachers is, is, is where we need all everybody's help on. Um, with our diversity of our community growing, uh, we need diverse teachers. Uh, so we're going to look towards this plan to uh, see where we can grow our uh, uh, teachers, especially diverse teachers, uh, where we can really retain great talent uh, and make this county and this school district uh, the most attractive place for teachers from all over the country to come to work. And then on culture and engagement, as this county really diversifies as this county grows in diversity. Uh, we as a school district, again, with 8,000 employees, uh, our numbers are, you know, something like 34, 35% Hispanic students, 19% uh, uh, or excuse me, 17% African American students. Uh, that, that, that's a, and those numbers are growing. That's, that's a huge amount of diversity. Uh, on the teacher, on the instructional side, uh, the numbers of African-American teachers kind of match that African-American student number. But on Hispanic students, like I said, it was about 34, 35 percent. On our instructional side, it's about 17 percent. Uh, and so, you know, on that culture and engagement side, we really need to concentrate on diversity, equity, and inclusion in our district. Uh, that's training all staff. Um, that's having, uh, you know, more cross-cultural events. Uh, really highlighting and celebrating our, our culture and our diversity, uh, I think is important not only for obvious reasons, but also on that retention side and on that recruiting side. Uh, when we look out to historically black colleges, historically Hispanic colleges and universities to really attract that top talent. We all know the success of Manatee Technical College uh, and our Deputy Superintendent Doug Wagner's work on that. Uh, it's one of the best, if not the best, technical college uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, we just heard from the, uh, our, our uh, leader at the airport how we're trying to create more programs there uh, on, on the uh, educational side. But uh, obviously, our adult career and technical uh, education programs are uh, looked at around the state uh, with a lot of envy. Uh, we just were up in Orlando uh, at a, a TSA conference. Um, kind of an engineering uh, conference for students, and, and we won more awards than any other county combined uh, at that conference. So uh, we, we know we're doing right, on, right stuff on this side, ACT side and the career technical side, and we just need to keep growing that and, and keep building upon the success. Uh, and really, obviously, it's, it's what you all and, and um, the community task force that has helped us kind of uh, start to create and think about this plan, uh, the work that uh, the universities and, and, our, and our nonprofits and our businesses do in this community for our school district is, again, uh, something that other school districts really envy. Uh, and uh, we have such a strong partnership. We have over 800, 900 businesses who partner with our schools. Uh, the work that United Way and uh, uh, Boys and Girls Club and our nonprofits in our community is just really unbelievable. And that's really what's going to help us maintain being an A school district, uh, raising that graduation rate, raising that grade level reading percentage. So this page really, and of course, uh, Jackie and her team at the Manatee Chamber of Commerce uh, has to be highlighted because uh, the chamber goes out of their way uh, with their programs, Project Teach and with uh, the Big Bang Theory uh, to really uh, work with our students. And, and that's, that's really, that's really the, the kind of where we're, where we're going with this. Again, this is a very draft plan. Uh, the board still needs to workshop this uh, many times um, uh, and still run this back through the community. But we wanted to come here today to kind of present to you that we're going through this process. <laughs> and that uh, we're ready to go, f hopefully, by the beginning of the next school year. And uh, it will probably run over the next couple of years because we have obviously have new standards coming out. Uh, we have that millage vote coming out. We have uh, a lot of work to do to, uh, um, uh, on like I just showed you, on kind of building that foundation that we can then really, on that next strategic plan, really go bold and big and um, really get to that goal of being the 
the number one and best school district in, in the state of Florida. So thank you for the time. Hopefully I went by it pretty quickly so we can. Uh, yeah, good job. Yeah. Thank you. I know you guys got a lot, lot, lot going on. Yes, yes. All right. Misty had a uh, question? A presentation yes. at the late hour. Yes. Great job. Yes. <laughs> um, so we spent the whole day, the county commission spent the whole day talking about traffic problems. Mm. And um, I'm sure you agree that we have some traffic challenges. And one of the things that I have thought about for a couple of years is that the school board is the largest employer in Manatee County. And would you consider adding to your strategic plan looking at incentives to try and um, allow your workforce to work at the schools that are closest to them mm. to help with the traffic congestion. Yep, that's an interesting idea. Yes, yes, we'll look at that. Yeah, I, I think I know, I can think, I know probably what the superintendent's thinking of, of you try to, um, you know, you, we've got, you know, 60, well, really 60, 64 schools, but, you know, some of those are charters, but, you know, you're constantly moving staff around and all resources and things. But, um, uh, you know, in 2013, uh, we had 18 D and F schools. Uh, last school year, we had two D schools, one being a charter. And I think this year we may not have any, any D schools. So, um, that shows that we're kind of shifting all that around and making sense. But so I, we will definitely look at that idea. Uh, um, uh, because I understand where you're going with that. Um, Thank you. And, and we just went through, you all haven't seen the results of this yet, but we went through a, a, a pretty large rezoning effort. So if any of you have school-aged children, you just received or, or a few months ago received a letter saying, you know, here's where you're, you know, here's the options and things. So uh, we, we, we had buses going all over this county that didn't make any sense, uh, and we were doing that for a while. Uh, so the, that whole new rezoning, that whole new bus routes will take place, obviously, in August with the new school year. So hopefully that will alleviate, alleviate some traffic. Uh, we are talking about a couple hundred buses on the road every morning and, and in the afternoon. So um, uh, that rezoning effort was a huge undertaking, and, and that really will help also with a lot of the a little bit of the overcrowding at some of our schools. So uh, we're going to kind of see when the dust settles where, where, where we are with that. But I think to keep constantly be thinking about that is important, especially this is why this is important, right, These, this Council of Government, so that you can present that idea to us so that we can take that back. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I, um, we did talk about transportation um, problems and solutions. Mm -hmm. We did have a long day to talk about it. And certainly I think to the extent that, and I've had some conversations with Cynthia about this, um, to the extent that you are really raising the bar for our public schools and allowing kids to go to the best schools that they can. And if those schools are in their district, that will be fabulous. And I get that's what you're trying to do, and I think that's important. You know, the school choice has been a great thing, but having parents drive their kids to school is really kind of messing up our road system in a lot of ways. So the, the extent that you guys are, you know, really raising the bar, we appreciate that for all the schools. And I know that is what your goal is. So um, you guys are partners with us. We will continue to have this conversation about, you know, how we try to get people off the roads and how we try to make the roads accommodate the people. And, and we're all trying to accommodate the great growth of this wonderful county, right? Mm -hmm. People want to live here. We can't tell them no. We just got to figure out how to accommodate everybody. So we know we're all partners in this together. So I thank you. Anybody other, uh, any other questions at this time for school board? Okay. Thank you and, and good luck. So I'm going to open it up to public comment. Is there anyone left? Yeah. Nobody wants to talk. Good deal. Um, we're going to close public comment. Any other comments by any officials at this time? Sherry, you got anything more? No. Okay. Long day. We're adjourned. Our next meeting is June 2nd, 2020 at 4 p.m. I should have said that.